Okay, uh, thanks a lot. It's uh, my great honor to give a talk here. And I mean, when I received an invitation uh, email, I was very nervous. So I asked my students, okay, what should I talk? And they told me, maybe you can talk about something which you will never write, or which is kind of internal knowledge between me and my colleagues. So, so that's, I, I decided that's a great idea. So that's what I'm going to do. So the large part of my talk is going to be about introduction to probabilistic programming. But then I will mention, to make a two comments. And then the second comment is somehow known. And maybe it's a bit related to some of the published paper. But the first comment is something, perhaps it's not very big, but it's something maybe relevant. And something that I talked with, I mean, especially Frank and David and so on, but which I think peer people were, I, I, they perhaps didn't hear about that much. Okay, so I mean, as I mean, some of you might heard about probabilistic programming, some of you never heard about it, but this, what I show you on the screen are some of the lists I and mean, some of the probabilistic programming languages that have been developed so far. And if your favorite language is not there, I apologize. And but it's it's I mean, it includes some representative probabilistic programming languages. And these probabilistic programming languages are developed by multiple different communities. For instance, the PSI Sober and uh, Hakaru, they are developed by peer people, like PSI Sober is from Martin Veshap's group. Hakaru is developed by Ken Shang and then his people in, from Indiana University. But peer people are not the, the only person who work on the probabilistic programming languages. For instance, Stan, which is perhaps the, one of the most popular probabilistic programming languages, is developed by statisticians. So Andrew Gelman and others, they even wrote a textbook, which, I mean, the, all the examples on the textbook's basic statistics is using or based on the stand. And the other program, probabilistic programming languages that I wrote there, they are developed by machine learning community. And I mean, they, Okay, when, for instance, when I talk to my friends, like uh, David and uh, uh, Frank, who worked on Anglicans, then I was very surprised when they talk about CPS transformation and so on. They are machine learning people, but they are using technologies for programming languages. And so these probabilistic programming languages combine many ideas from statistics and then maybe programming languages and so on. And furthermore, recently, there has been probabilistic programming languages which uh, try to combine some ideas from deep learning and probabilistic programming together. So my friend Frank told me, I mean, he's a bit relieved about his line of research because compared to deep learning, where you can see lots of papers almost every day, probabilistic programming is reasonably popular, so it's not that popular, so that he can do some work on his own face and then, what do, I mean, not worry too much about being scooped. But it turns out, and, but he be, start to become a bit worried because now the, the word deep start to appear together with the probabilistic, so that maybe some people may, might pay a lot more attention than field be, might become a bit crowded. But anyhow, the point I'm making here is that probabilistic programming languages are kind of, it's a kind of area where people from statistics, machine learning, and prob programming languages start to pay some attention about this. So what I'm going to explain in the beginning part of my talk is I will show you some introduction to probabilistic programming language by one, one example. And that example is not real, if you are really knows everything about Bayesian statistics and so on, this is not a representative example of Bayesian statistics because it uses Bayesian inference to solve optimization problem. But it gives us some sense about what prob probabilistic programming is about. Okay. So, so before starting this example, I mean, by the way, my talk consists of, I mean, the one way to understand my talk is it had a three big examples, and that's, that's it. So if you understand these examples, then you can say, oh, you fully understood my talk. So they, they, before starting talking about talks, I mean, the, the examples, I want to give some idea about, I mean, what kind of, I mean, what, what the programmers of probabilistic programming language really usually go through. So one kind of uh, kind of target audience of the probabilistic programming language is statisticians or data scientists, and they go through the kind of process that I describe on the screen. 
Suppose, so one, a good way to understand this is just imagine that you became a data scientist who want to identify the location of the black hole. Okay? Black hole is not usually observed, but you know a lot about black hole because of the many knowledge from the physics. So what you're going to do is that you will first try to develop a model based on your physics, the knowledge from physics, and, and then so they will write something called the generative models. But this model is not going to incorporate various information that's gathered about galaxies. So, I mean, astronomers collected lots of data about the galaxies. So this, the model that you describe is, in a sense, I mean, one, you can view it as kind of randomized program. If you run this program, it behaves according to the laws of the physics, but it will generate a new universe again and again. So, okay. So, so the, what you need to do after this going through the step one is, to, is that you have to fit this model to the data, which is real observation from, the, from various I mean, telescopes and various places. So to do so, what you have to do is that you have to design an algorithm which modify this model to, to fit the data. I mean, if you are more formal, that process corresponds to so-called posterior inference in Bayesian statistics. But intuitively what it does is that your model incorporates some knowledge about physics. Now you want to incorporate information that's coming from the data. And that can be done automatically. I mean, that can be done easily. So you have to design some algorithm that does this job. So that's the step two that you have to do. And once this step two is done, what you can do is you just run this algorithm with the model to the data. And then once you have this fit model, then you can use this model to analyze or predict the location of the black hole. But it turns out all these steps are not very easy. Uh, oh, by the way, this fitting model to the data is called posterior inference, in the, especially in the context of Bayesian statistics. And then the model which is fit to the data is called posterior distribution. Typically in this setting, model is described in terms of probability distribution. So this second, the fit model is called a posterior distribution. So I will use these words quite a bit. And doing this process is not very easy, and, but according to my friend, the Frank, he said the, the step two is particularly dif difficult, especially step one requires expertise on the domain. So like physicists can perhaps write a model, but step, step one that can be done by the expert in the domain, but step two requires knowledge about machine learning and statistics and so on. So it's not very common that a person who working on, say, astronomy also knows very well about the inference algorithms in machine learning. So especially those people, and it's also the expert for machine learning, the step two becomes quite hard. So the idea about probabilistic programming is to, in a sense, automate the step two. So in the prob if you do exactly go through this process in probabilistic programming language, then we actually describe a model as a program. So I said uh, this model is a bit like a randomized program. So we actually write a randomized, I mean, that's a program which is a bit like a randomized program. And then this language usually comes with very strange runtime. So this, you can think of probabilistic programming language as a programming language whose runtime is very non-standard. And this non what this non-standard runtime does is that it performs posterior inference. So you can just use this runtime to perform the posterior inference. Of course, you might fail because if the performance of this runtime is not as good. But some cases, you, this performance is good enough, and then you may get some, data, some uh, information. So if now step two disappears, because it's done once and for all for all the users in the probability programming language. Now, once you do it, you, then now what you can do is you can use this generic inference to perform the inference. And, and then the fit the model to the data. So that's the step that can be done. So one objective of a probabilistic programming language is to get rid of this, this uh, process of designing custom inference algorithm and replace it by one generic inference algorithm developed by machine learning expert. Now that's a one way to understand probabilistic programming language. And another way to understand probabilistic programming language from purely programmer's perspective who has no idea about machine learning or the modeling can be it's a language where you can kind of invert the program, invert the execution of the program. Okay, it has a random support, a random choice, but there are many other languages which support a random choice. But what distinguishes probabilistic programming language from the others is that it provides a facility 
well, it, it's, it has a very strange runtime where the execution can be done in some, in some sense in the reverse way. So think about, I mean, the, this probabilist programming language. So imagine that you have uh, two programs. One program is a function f that take a real number and produce some element of type tau. And then you have another function, which is called score, that take an element of type tau and then give a number between 0 and 1. I mean, intuitively, score represents how good that output is. So at, let's say the low value of, or maybe high value of a score is what we really want. So then, given this pair of this program fn score, what you can do is you provide an input, real number, run f, and compute its score. So that's kind of a user process of running, prob running program. But suppose that we want to do something different, okay? We want to find an input which make f to produce uh, the, the output which have a high score. So that's a bit like if you have an, abil if you have an ability to invert a program, this is a kind of thing perhaps we might think about doing, okay? And also it's a bit related to solving some form of optimization problem. And, and then in the user programming language, I mean, in order to solve the problem like this, I mean, if you have to come up with a new kind of algorithms, custom algorithm for this. But in probabilistic programming languages, this kind of things can be done by runtime, which is called inference engines. Okay. So the, the message of this slide is that another way to understand probabilistic programming system or probabilistic programming language is a programming language where you can invert the execution in some sense. And if I match what I described here with what I told you about Bayesian modeling, this f roughly correspond to the generative model that I described, and score roughly correspond to the data, and then invert the process of inverting this execution, of finding an input, really correspond to the posterior inference process. Okay, so I hope this gives you very superficial understanding about what this is about. So let's just go to the concrete example. So this is an example that I took from Frank and uh, Brooks Page. And so th in this example, we want to solve, so I, I guess some of you who attended like summer school, they already saw this before, but just, I think, then you can relax and sleep a little bit. So, so this, this example, the, what we want to do is that we want to solve the following problem. We want to move the, there, there are one end of the screen, there's a 20 balls are falling down, and we want to move these balls to the target bin. If you don't do anything, you can't do anything about this. But we are, what we are allowed to do is we are allowed to place bumpers. So if we, our goal is to put bumpers into the right location so that these balls, if these balls are bouncing, and we, so that the, the balls get bounced and then move into the right target, which is the bin on the left-hand side of the screen. So I thought the fun part is actually see how it works. So let me show you the demo. Ooh. Okay. If we make it larger. So you don't need to read this source code. It's a so I'm going to run this. So this is kind of one simulation. So all the code is in Java Virtual Machine. So I mean, you might be not able to see actually something, but you can kind of see that something is moving and falling down, right? So, so there are 20 boards are falling down. But if you, if you place some bumpers, they are moving around. So again, maybe it's a bit unclear, but you can see that they are jump, something goes up and down, up and down. So they are jumping around. but because the location of the bumpers are not very good, they are not really reaching the target beam. Okay. So the, uh, the, what we want to solve is we want to find the appropriate location of these bumpers by using probabilistic programming system. Okay. So how to solve this using probabilistic programming language? And we're going to use Anglican, which is a prob probabilistic programming language on top of some language called Clojure, which is a cousin of the, the scheme, okay? Java virtual machine version of the scheme. And then we follow this modeling process. So we, we're gonna approach this problem in three steps. The first, we will de describe a model, but this model is really simple. It's re essentially, we are writing a simulator. It's the simulator randomly placed the bumpers, 
And then it just runs the simulation and see how many balls are in the target. So that's what this model is doing. In some sense, it specifies the solution space, and it randomly explores the solution space. If we just have this simulator, nobody can solve this problem because nobody knows what the user actually wants. So we have, want to ex express our success criteria by encoding the, the hours, I mean, what we want in terms of observation. So we will do some encoding, but at the, actually what this encoding says at the end of the day is that if more balls are becomes in the target after the simulation, we get a high marks. Okay. So, so we have the simulator is a bit like the function f that I described in the previous slide. This, the step two corresponds to this score function that I described in the slide. Uh, then what we, if we run the inference engines of the probabilistic programming language, it will try to bring these two things together and want to try to come up with a solution. So we will use inf in posterior inference engines of Anglican and solve this problem. Okay. So I, as I said, I'm going to show you the source code for so solving this problem. And then I will, at the moment, I will ignore this success criteria and then show you how the Anglican code can be written. And Anglican is, as I said, it's very much like a scheme, but syntax is a little bit different, but essentially you can think of it as a scheme. And Anglican model can be, is written as a function. In this case, we say it's a def query, it's a, it's a way to specify, we are saying that we are defining Anglican model, and then the query is like a function, so it's a, it's, the name of the function is called physics zero. It doesn't take any parameter, so that's why you can see the, the square parenthesis which doesn't contain anything. And then the good thing, one, I mean, some people emphasize this aspect a lot, but one good thing about probabilistic programming language is when you write a model, you can actually include all the source code in the existing programming language. So in this particular case, we're going to use some routines from Java Virtual Machine. And just like we have uh, imports or uh, statements in many programming languages, well, in, the, in Anglican, we can import routines from JVM. So we will import these uh, three routines one is called create word, the second is called simulate word, the last one is like a query of the final outcome of the simulation that's boards in the inbox. Okay, so these are the routines, not in Anglican, they are routines from JVM, so Java bytecode. And then we define a query. So the, here's a step that we do. We, we say that there are the eight bumpers, so N, this, Minus bumpers means with the number of bumpers is eight, and we are defining a function f. That that function doesn't take any parameter, but if we call that function, it randomly pick the location of a bumper. So the first random choice is about x coordinate of the bumper. Second random choice is about y coordinate of the bumper. Okay. So if we call f, it just randomly find the position x y position of a bumper. And then repeatedly means it just called the, this function, which doesn't take any parameter eight times in this case. And then it will produce the location of eight bumpers, and that's going to be bound to BS. And then we will invoke Java version of JVM routines. So we will call create a word, and then we will run this simulation using JVM code. And then once the simulation is finished, we will ask how many boards are in the target. Okay? And then we, we return the, the number of the pair, essentially, which contain information about number of boards which are in the target, as well as the location of the bumpers. So this is a kind of routine which you will write if you want to write that this is the simulator I mean, for, for this case. So let's see how it performs. So this, what's written there is exactly what I showed you. And then we will, I mean, in this case, we don't really need any inference algorithm at all. We just need to run this program a few times. So we run it essentially 200 times. And I will show you the best outcome in terms of the number of balls in the target. Sometimes it works really well because everything is random. Let's see what happens this time. So it does, actually, it does, instead of 200 simulation, it do, does about 2,000 or 3,000 simulation. Uh, so it, 
it's not moving. I, mean, I don't know what happened. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, something happens. Yeah, it looks like a... Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, so it, nothing really happens here. I mean, something happens, but not in a way that we like. So we will change it a little bit. So we will include some success criteria. And in some sense, this is a core part of the probabilistic programming. We can express, in a sense, what we want for the output a little bit. So the way we do is that in this, because this is more like an optimization problem, we have to do some form of encoding. But we will introduce some kind of artificial random variables, which is a noisy observation of the balls in the target. So we observe how many balls are in the target, but there are some noise. So we, my observation may be inaccurate. But then we claim this noisy observation was actually 20. So there are 20 balls are falling around, falling down. And then we, we say we observed how many balls are in the target. But then at the end, we claim that, oh, actually, there are 20 balls in the target. So that means all the other randomness in the system has to be adjusted so that to, to make this observation as consistent as possible. So that's what we're going to do. So we will write this observed statement. And this observed statement say, it says, let's talk about two things. It says that we generate samples from normal distributions whose mean is number of balls, standard deviation is 1. At the same time, we also said we actually observed the value of this random variable. And observed value is equal to 20. And more kind of intuitive explanation about what really happened is we had make a noisy observation on how many balls are in the targets. And according to our noisy observation, 20 balls are in the target. And this 20 may come from noise or maybe come from the exact value. But if small noise has a higher probability, that it is, if execution actually produced 20 balls in the target, that's more likely that match with this observation a lot more. So again, let's run this. Uh. Yeah. So I'm going to run one inference algorithm called uh, LMH, lightweight metropolis hasting algorithm. And to see how what kind of result we get. So as I said, sometimes it doesn't work. That's because it's all random. And let's see the Oh, yeah, this time it doesn't work that, that well. <laughs> yes. So this is really not the ideal arrangement. I mean, the one that I typically try, the, the numbers we get, it, I mean, you, there is a number five, if you can see it. That means five balls are in the target. Usually the numbers are like 18 and 19. But maybe the randomness doesn't like pop off that much. <laughs> OK. So that's what we can do. And then now suppose we want to do a bit more. So if you, if you see, uh, I mean, so this is the output that I did in my, at home. But then if you see some solutions, then you can kind of notice that you don't really need eight bumpers. I mean, you can reduce the number of bumpers because I, mean, I think usually maybe we need about two or three to actually solve this problem. So let's try to encode this other criteria into probabilistic programming system. And then just try to reduce the number of bumpers. And how can we do it? And so we're going to change this model a little bit. So instead of setting the number of bumpers to eight, we're going to say it's going to be a, this, we will make it random. And so it's going to be a value sampled from Poisson distribution. Again, if you don't know Poisson, it doesn't matter. What they say is it's a distribution on non-negative natural num non-negative integers, or maybe just, just natural numbers here. So, so it's a, for, for number of bumpers, it's, it's just something which produces the numbers. The, then 
if you just do this, again, we don't really say what we want is to reduce the number of bumpers. So we have to put some extra criteria, success criteria which say that reduce the number of bumpers is, is, is good. And we follow the similar trick. And we say that we make a noisy observation on the number of bumpers. And then noisy observation says the number of bumpers is zero, which doesn't make sense. But it also kind of, actually, we can't really solve this problem with the zero bumpers. But it also gives an indication that if you, if you use fewer bumpers, that match with the observation better. Okay? So using the first observe, we said what we want is we want to use the small number of bumpers. Second observe, we said what we want is we want to move many, as many balls to the target as possible. Now if you do this, then run the simulation again. I hope this works. So I thought it's nice to show you simulation. I can relax a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes time because it runs this simulation, I think in this case, 3,000 times. So it's, it solved the problem. I mean, actually give a better result than before. And maybe in my screen. Yeah, it uses about six bumpers instead of eight. Okay. So it, yeah, at home, when I tried this, this actually worked out even better. So it uses only three bumpers. So it, the, the result is a bit random, but you can kind of see that. I mean, I hope this example shows you what kind of things you can achieve with probabilistic programming language. You can specify program. It's a bit like a SMT solver or constraint solver. You, which part of which can be written as a program. We write what the, the, some generative process, and then we describe what we want. Then somehow the entire runtime system brings these two things together to come up with the appropriate solution. OK. So that's my introduction on probabilistic programming. Then I want to make uh, two remarks. Very likely, I have time only for the first. That's great, because that's the part that I want to talk about. And then the, the first remark is that, I mean, when the, I think some part of my past life was maybe current life as well, is about I worked on static program analysis quite a bit. And then often when you hear about static program analysis, I mean, you say, oh, that's a technique that you can use for verification, maybe, or maybe finding some properties of a program. But it happens that, in some sense, the key part of a static program analysis, which is program abstractions, can also be very useful, or can actually be used for the inference algorithm in probabilistic programming systems. So that's the, the one message, maybe the key message of my talk, if you care about some, something related to research. Okay. So, so the, the reason I bring this up is because, I mean, I don't think many people talk about this that much. And also, I feel that there are some potentials. And I will give you, so I don't have any concrete result about this. But while preparing this talk, I do some experiment, show some promise about this type of idea. So I will show you this, this promise. But I feel that more, some, if we use the p techniques from PL, we can make a big improvement in this direction. So the, some, something that I'm going to do is that I will show you how heap or object abstraction is relevant for the, for the inference in probabilistic programming system. So as I said, this is only half baked, but I hope it kind of carries some message, I mean, give you some intuition. So now let's think about to understand this as this mess, these things. They, we have to revisit our understanding about this sample statement in probability programming language. If we have a sample from normal distribution, then one way, typical way to understand the sample statement is See, it doesn't work. So, so is that we draw a sample from a distribution? Okay, we make a random draw. That's a typical way of understanding what's really happening.
But there is a more kind of inference algorithm friendly way to understand what happens, which is you can view this as a like a memory allocation algorithm, allocation routine. It creates random variable objects. From purely implementation perspective, it's an object which is read only, but its value is initialized randomly. Okay? So it creates this random variable object and read its value and return it to the user. And inference algorithm actually get hold of this random variable objects when it performs the inference. In some sense, runtime actually uses these random variable objects. And why this perspective is useful? Because if you view this the sample as an allocation, essentially, then we can start to ask, oh, maybe we can apply the memory abstractions that, we, that this peer community they came up with. So, so for instance, suppose this routine is inside some function f. So def m is a way to write function in Anglican. Suppose it, this routine is inside some function f. then. Maybe if you are familiar with the pointer analysis, we can do the so-called allocation site abstraction, which means that every random variable created from same program locations are grouped together and treated in a single I mean, kind of entity. Or you maybe do the, say, context sensitivity abstraction, which means we're going to divide this all the object created from same location into multiple different groups based on some information about calling context. Also, people came up with object sensitivity and so on. But it turns out, so these type, although it's not exactly the same, this kind of abstraction is already implicitly used in the, inside the inference engines of the Anglican system. And my machine learning colleagues called them as addressing scheme. So when I heard about it, I thought, oh yeah, this is just implementation detail. But I realized, actually, what they mean by addressing scheme is some form of abstractions of the, this identity of random variables. Okay. And, and then, because their purpose is different from the typical kind of goal of static, uh, static analysis and verification, the way they design this, this abstraction for random variable objects has a slightly different flavor. Okay. But I think that maybe some techniques from Pierre may give a new kind of perspective and new direction about how we can improve this. So let me give you the, this flavor, I mean, kind of explain this flavor a little bit by some pictorially first, and then just give you a concrete evidence. Okay. So, so imagine that we have the, we consider all the possible execution of a probabilistic program, single probabilistic program. So we run it many, many times and generate all the random variables. And then the, what the abstraction does, both heap abstraction, or object abstractions, and the abstraction used in Anglican, is that it groups these random variables together. It, okay? So it identify, it pick some notion of similar similarity, and based on this notion of similarity, it group all these objects together. And then it's, I mean, you exploit this, this information about these groups to perform static analysis, or in the case of inference algorithm, it, that kind of things helps to generalize what we used good samples before. But one kind of, I, I don't think this is, should be always the case, but one different kind of flavor that you can see in the probabilistic programming system is that for single execution, if, if you fix the single execution, there may be multiple random variable objects that may be created. In, but then typically, in the, in the abstraction that's employed in the probabilistic programming system, do not really group, try to kind of identify different random variable objects over the single execution. So the purpose of this grouping is to identify similar objects across the execution, not over the single execution. In static analysis, this grouping happens over the single as well as across the execution. So one consequence is, Typically, if the, my program can generate infinitely many random variables, potentially, unboundedly many random variables, the number of equivalence classes in this grouping can be infinite. Okay, okay so that's the flavor. And then I want to kind of show that this, this how this happens and this actually can affect the, the performance of the inference algorithm using one other example called the divorce rate examples. So, so this is an example taken from uh, non-pyro web page as well as, I mean, originally from this 
the, the, per, the person's Mac list, I mean, his book called Statistical Rethinking. So this is a data set for 50 US states, and data set contains divorce rates for each of the 50 states. I think it's maybe 2009 or 8, as well as four other statistics. The first statistic say median age of marriage. The second one is called marriage rate. The third is called population. The fourth is called number of waffle houses. And I didn't know what that means, but I heard the waffle house is a bit like a McDonald's. So there are numbers here and there. Okay. So, so then the, the problem we want to solve is we want to find a predictor for the divorce rate from the other statistics. And that predict we in particular looking for a linear predictor. So it, so it's a, have a linear combination. And that's a really easy problem, then which has, it's like a, if you take a statistics course, that's the first thing that you learn. But we want to make problem a little bit challenging by doing so-called model selection. So we put some constraint which say, we want our predictor use only three variables, uh, three inputs out of four inputs. So you can ignore the age parameter, or maybe you can ignore the marriage rate parameter, population parameter, or waffle house parameter, and so on. So that's the kind of problem we want to solve. We want to find the predictor, and then one part of the predictor is it ignores one parameter, and for the rest, you want to find the right linear combination. Okay, so let's, before actually solving this, let's get some idea about what our solution should look like. Let's do some cheating, and then just visualize it, and just get some idea about what this actually looks like. So this is a visualization of divorce rates and the age. So you can see the anti-correlation. So if somebody gets married later in their life, then the, the very is less likely to get divorced, but and so on. But for the number of waffle house, I mean it's very hard to see what's really happening. But actually there is a correlation between the number of waffle house, <laughs> and and then actually the analysis shows that the correlation is quite significant. I mean, if you get rid of all the correlation exists from the age, okay? So, right. Okay, so, so, I mean, before actually showing the Anglican code, I will show you the predictor informally. The, the predictor looks like this. We have, uh, I mean, the, it's a linear functions that combines this parameter a, m, p, w, but so for each of the coefficients or the, the basic constant, they are all unknowns, but we have a one extra the parameter called C, which decides which parameter to ignore. So for instance, C is equal to zero. That means the capital A has to be zero. C is equal to one. Capital M has to be zero, and so on. Okay, so now how we solve this problem. So the way we solve this problem is we will we, we solve this using Anglican. And then that means we're going to approach this problem from Bayesian approach, which means that all the unknowns will become random variables. So there were six unknowns, coefficients for A, M, P, W parameter, and B, the, ba the bias, together with the decision, which is C. So we will have uh, six random choices in, in this program. So we define the Anglican query. And then the, we, now this time we take parameter because there is a data set. And that parameter is uh, five lists of size 50. The first one contains the, the information about the Media, the age, the second contains marriage rate, and so on. And then the output of this program should be these unknowns, the capital C, A, M, P, W, B. Okay. So, so then we sample C, so now we're going to describe our model. We, sam we sample C uniformly from 0 to 4. That means before prior, I mean, A prior, we have no idea which one we can ignore. Okay, so you see it can be equal to 0, 1, 2, up to 3. And then, if for each of the cases of the C, we will do case analysis, because if C is equal to 0, we have to make sure the coefficient for the age should be equal to 0. C is equal to 1, we have to make sure coefficient for the marriage should be equal to 0, and so on. So we're going to define A and P, W. So this is square bracket, you can view it as like a tuple. And, and then we will define it by case analysis on the value of C. So if value of C is equal to 0, then the first component, which is the coefficient for the age, should be equal to 0. 
The others will be sampled from normal distribution, mean zero, standard deviation two, which means that we are expecting the value of these coefficients to be typically close to zero and within the range between minus four and plus four. And we do something similar for C1, C2, C3. Here I just show the case for the C3, where we just set the coefficient for the last guy to be equal to zero. Okay, then we sample B from the normal distributions. When for with this here we use a some smaller standard deviation. I just took it from the examples in the Pyro web page. And then we define the function f, linear function. And then finally, we, we say that the predict the divorce actual divorce rate should be a noisy observation of the outcome of our predictor. So that's what this big kind of map observed statement is saying. So really, the key part is this one. It says that for each of the divorce rates, we make a prediction based on the other statistics, and actual divorce rate should be the noisy observation of the, our predictor. Okay. So that's our model. And, and then I wrote this model and performed the inference. And this is the outcome of the inference that I got using 20,000 samples. And then as we expect, so this is the probability distribution for C, okay? C, the high value means we can ignore it, okay? Because the value of C is a which parameter we can ignore. Low value means that parameter is really important. So we, so we can see that the, the age received the lowest parameter, which we, we expect because you saw that anti-correlation there. So the, our, the posterior tells us actually you shouldn't ignore the age parameter. But one thing strange is that it also has a very low probability for Waffle House. So the, the inference say that actually Waffle House is also very important. And then they, although you can't really see it clearly using this graph, if you really compute the number, the number, the, the probability for say population is five times higher than the Waffle House, which means Waffle House is in some sense five times more important than the number of population. That sounds very strange then it turns out this is actually not correct. And actually, a surprising thing is the Waffle House is actually quite important for this prediction. I mean, because correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, so something strange happens here. But it's not as important as this outcome, say. So actually, if you generate a lot more sample from a bit better model that I will show you later, the, the outcome we get is like the one that you see in this red box. So the number of, uh, the probability for the Waffle House is roughly the same as, but slightly smaller than the probability for the population. So that's what we should get. So you'll see that there are some result is not quite right, which means that if you run this algorithm forever, it will converge to the right value. But within the fixed amount of time, it didn't really converge to the right value. So then what should we do? So, so then one easy thing you can do is actually by changing the memory abstraction that's used by this algorithm slightly, you can get a result very, very quick, the good result very quick, um, I mean, good result. So, so for in terms of this program, what it, it turns out that by changing the program a little bit, we can kind of make this inference algorithm to adopt a different abstractions. The, the way to do it is put some label, okay? We put a label here. So for, for the samples in this conditional branching, if the sample statement is for A, we're gonna put a label called quote A. If sample statement is for M, we're gonna put a sample, the, the label called quote M and so on, okay? So you can see that although the, the, the sample for the, this uh, line four and then another sample the below, I mean, they are in the different program locations. We're gonna put the same label. What effectively what it tells us, we tell the system is that instead of using allocation site-based abstraction for random variable objects, try to use a bit more aggressive abstractions, which try to group random variable from two different locations together. So all the random variable labeled with M will group together. So with this, if we run, generate exactly the same number of samples, uh, 20,000 samples, then we get much better result. Uh, so that's, 
And then that result is actually quite close to the ground truth that we calculated. So this is a very minor change. It's a source code transformation. Maybe this is not the only way to do this. But the reason I'm showing this is that changing the abstraction actually can affect the, the outcome of the inference. And it is, so I mean, if you are familiar with Monte Carlo, then you see that the top one is for the new model. That means every sample, the value of C changes quite a lot. The bottom one is an old model, value of C doesn't change very much. That kind of indicates something is not quite right from the bottom. Okay, so then the, you, the natural question is why does it work better? So that's the natural question. And then the, the reason is that it makes this inference algorithms that, that we can, it, it kind of help inference algorithm to reuse good samples in much more efficient way. So this inference algorithm, because it has to, in a sense, invert the program, what it does is that it runs the program many, many times. It's not just running once. It runs the program many, many times. During this execution, it finds some good, good samples. It's, in some sense, try to exploit these samples. Okay? Good sample means it's matched with the data very well. So, but if you could give a good, I mean, the more, the kind of abstraction that I, I mean, I showed for in the new model, it kind of help the inference algorithm to identify how to I mean, help them to reuse the good sample because essentially sample for M in different program locations should be regarded in some sense, they should be very, very similar. Okay. So the new inference, this new abstraction can help the, 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 the inference algorithm to reuse good sample it discovered. So I prepared lots of slides to explain what really happens in Monte Carlo, but I guess I have about three minutes, so which means either I explain it in a way nobody understands, or it's, it's, I just got stopped in the middle, so I will just skip this part, okay? So there are, I mean, I'll put my slide on my web page so that you can have, I mean, if you want to understand why new abstraction really help the reuse of the good samples, you can get some idea about how it happens. Yes. Okay, so, so for, for this part, right, as I said, abstraction of random variable objects happens implicitly by the inference algorithms. And, but then I only show the Monte Carlo based algorithm, but actually the algorithm based on say variational inference or some other algorithm based on the neural net together with variational inference, so-called amortized inference. They also make some, some decisions about how to, how to, what kind of abstraction it employ. So roughly speaking, therefore, that this is a second bullet point means that for each of these equivalence class, we have a one neural net in some sense, which means the parameters for the each equivalence class is in a sense shared. So or some kind of more sharing is happening. So that means if you choose the right abstraction, then maybe the neural nets can be much more, much more easy to train. And actually, I want to make that point by examples, but I failed to train my neural net. So, but anyhow, the, the point I'm making is the abstractions, in a sense, kind of guide the design of the neural net, and that's closely tied to what kind of generalization you can do. If it sees a lot more examples, then it has a more likely to find a much general pattern out of this. So, so it's closely tied with it. And, uh, and as I said, the reason I bring this up is not because of, I said, this is a great research, but more like there's an opportunity, which I talk with my friend, but looks like nobody cared about this. But on the other hand, looks like this may be an interesting place where PL techniques can be integrated with the machine learning tech in a deep way. Okay. The, let me just mention about the second point, and then I will very briefly and then finish. My second point is that the probabilistic program actually have a kind of errors, which is very strange and very tricky. Okay. And, and that's very tricky that's because the runtime of probabilistic programming system is not exact. So, okay. we usually, if usually, if you do the testing, given an input, you get an output, and that output is exactly what you expect according to the semantics. But the, in the Markov chain Monte Carlo based algorithms or the variational inference algorithms, this runtime system only guaranteed to produce the right answer 
in some case, when you run this algorithm forever, okay? So, so that means sometimes it's very hard to detect the kind of errors that's produced by these algorithms that exist in these kind of programs. So here's an example which I will skip. They said I'm done. So, but then I will just show you some general patterns on these tricky examples. The one case is that if I write the models, then algorithm try to get some information about posterior distribution, but it may be that the posterior is just undefined. So, so posterior is not necessarily defined, and, and that can happen. So that the example that I skipped is actually that example. So target is undefined, and I'm running approximate algorithms. I get results, some result. So then it's very difficult to see that actually the, the, the target, I mean, the, the, this be, from this behavior of the approximate algorithm to see that the, the target is undefined. So this gives uh, some kind of a domain where maybe PR technique can be applied. Another is, it appeared in the popular this year in my paper and then some other papers from the Vikash's group. And various, many algorithms that employed in the machine learning, they make some assumptions implicitly. Some assumptions are about so-called support some assumptions are about integrability, differentiability, and so on. These assumptions may get violated. And so, I mean, those are kind of very definite errors that perhaps some PR techniques can detect and fix very easily. The last point, I, I mentioned something like this to my machine learning friend, like Tom Rainforth, and then he told me uh, he's interested about this kind of question, but he said one thing that really interests interest him is the point, the last point, which is, I mean, these machine learning people, or maybe statisticians, they are, they are very smart. So they are fully aware of the limitation of their techniques. So what they did is that they came up with the runtime diagnostics. So for, if you run STEM, there it reports not just the estimated value, but also reports how confident it, it is about the results by returning something called R hat, or sometimes returning effective sample size and so on. But uh, typically, this information is good enough. If you see the R hat, that value is close to one, then you see that, oh, I can actually trust the result. Otherwise, it's, you can't really trust the result. But what my friend told me is that sometimes this runtime diagnostic fails. It's like unknown, unknown. So then you want to really know that, I mean, then that's the prop kind of cases where you don't really know. I mean, that you feel like you are, everything is fine, but you are, I mean, the actual outcome is, is wrong. So he said, if static analysis, or maybe PL techniques can be employed to detect this unknown unknown, which is cases where runtime diagnostic fails or behave incorrectly, but you somehow pointed it out that he said he might be much more interested in what we are doing. Okay, so the take-home message of this talk is that, I mean, the probabilistic programming is, is fun, then I hope that at least maybe encourage you to, or maybe you get a bit motivated to write some examples for yourself, either to try Anglican or WebPPL or Pyro, anything that you like. And two messages are program abstractions. Yes, that's mostly used for verification, but maybe it has a different use because it's essentially about generalization. The third one, the probability programming language might kind of generate new type of questions like verification questions a bit like Leibniz properties. It's not very easy to check, but if it work, maybe we can come up with some good solutions about it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, hang -Sang. So we have time for some questions. In your example, then you did a case split on C, and then in each case you generated three random variables. And it was not clear how they should be related in the different branches. If I had written that code naively, I would just have generated four random variables, and then used a case split to set one of them to zero. Yes. Would that make for a program that is easier to run, or would I be committing some dreadful mistake oh, in so generating and not using a value? So your program will be easy to run, and then the, the reason I break this is just to come up with some examples that demonstrate my point. So you're, you're exactly right, right. So I actually tried three models. One is the one I showed, another is one I fixed, the last one is exactly the one that you described. And the second and third behave a bit similar way. Yes. Thank you.
Hi, thank you for the talk. I'm curious, um, it, when, when you were showing the sort of different abstraction version, you showed it by annotating each sample site with uh, a label. Um, and one model for how you, know, how you can support this sort of thing is to have programmers responsible for defining the abstraction. Do you see that, or what do you think the trade-offs are between sort of having programmers annotate with names and maybe more automated techniques for developing these abstractions? And what criteria would those automated techniques use? Uh, so, frankly, my, I don't really know. So I feel that the kind of, for, for the very small models, the number of the abstraction that I have in mind is very limited. So then maybe, for, for instance, in the context of, say, amortize inference, you may be, be able to learn by do, and so it's a context where I can, it's okay to spend lots of time as a pre-processing, then maybe there's some searching algorithm may be useful. And also my students also complained and said, it's, I mean, who knows, maybe doing this labeling may degrade the performance. So you're right, I mean, it's not obvious, but I feel that that can be, that means that there is some interesting abstraction problem in this domain. Thank you.